talk about the finger. <clears throat> so, in the finger, normally, uh, uh, the DIPJ, fortunately, is not involved in, in, in rheumatoid arthritis. Some form of mutilant form can involve, similarly, thumb also, it's mainly uh, uh, the proximal joints, the IP joint is not involved. So remember that the deformity in, 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 in fingers are the primary deformity is at PIPJ, it, but there is always deformity at the distal joint, but that is a secondary deformity. So the primary problem or pathology is in the, uh, in the PIPJ. And there's only two deformity possible in the fingers. Either it is flexed at PIPJ or it is extended when it is flexed. Uh, it is called butanide deformity and there is opposite uh, compensation or opposite deformity at DIPJ. So it is flexed, there will be extension. And if it is hyperextended at uh, uh, PIPJ, the distal will flex and the one with hyperextension is called uh, swan neck deformity. One with flexion is called butanide deformity. As simple as that. So let's see what happened here. So exactly same thing. The examiner may ask you why this is happening. So this is the uh, most important slide if you want to understand for the finger problem or most of the hand problem, you will understand this. Uh, the extensor mechanism is a complex mechanism in the hand. Uh, normally it is... Uh, fleshy uh, in, uh, intrinsic forms the lateral bands and uh, central slip uh, is inserted at your uh, PIPJ across uh, PIPJ and then uh, the two lateral bands and these band together forms a lateral band or sometimes we call lateral conjoint band. So remember uh, at uh, your MCPJ, there's a common extensor, and this is the main extensor for your um, for your MCPJ through this sagittal band. As you go distally, uh, it trifurcate into three, so two lateral band, and which eventually get uh, uh, at uh, uh, from interosseous, uh, they 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 get their contribution, and then together then get inserted right at the DIPJ, uh, and uh, they are hold together because they are inserting here with a, this triangle called a triangular retinaculum ligament. So the, remember this, uh, the, the lateral band and they going to the common insertion and they are being held at the back by this triangular ligament because this is a piece is triangular. Whereas the central slip goes and insert here at the middle phallic. So it will cause the extension of the PIPJ and it stops here. And extension of the DIPJ is caused by these lateral band which has got contribution from intrinsic and the, and, and the, the intrinsic also contribute for extension of the PIPJ. So the, the normal function of the extrins, intrinsic is uh, a flexion at MCPJ because they are on the volar side there and extension at PIP and DIPJ. The, the, the extrinsic extensor uh, work as an extensor for uh, MCPJ and then as a central slip uh, with in, uh, interosseous, it works as an extensor for PIPJ and as a lateral band with the contribution from the interosseous, it's worked an extension for the uh, terminal phallus. And that's all you need to know about the anatomy. And if you see from the side, it's exactly the same. Just one thing to remember that there's another uh, ligament here. So remember, whenever we talk about finger, uh, uh, the, when you when the word come retinaculum, retinaculum mean finger. So uh, people sometimes get confused about these wording. So triangular, you can call it a triangular. The three ligaments holding these tendons in different uh, uh, forms. So this is holding at the dorsum. It's called triangular ligament. There's another ligament which is like a square or a rectangle called transverse uh, retinacular ligament, and this is trying to hold uh, these in the palmar side. So to keep them on the volar side or palmar side is transverse. To keep them on the dorsum is a triangular. So you remember these two ligaments and there is a third ligament which normally we talk about which goes from the volar side and goes to the extensor side like in oblique fashion and that is called oblique retinacular ligament. So if you remember these three ligaments, you're fine. I remember the extensor mechanism. So this is very important because this will explain you the next few slides 
what happened. So remember, whenever you're talking about finger, talk about, uh, again, synovitis, leading to destruction of some structure, leading to overaction of some structure, leading to some particular deformity. And, and once you know these basic concepts, you can make it up what is happening uh, in your mind. So let's talk about this first deformity, uh, which is a butinite deformity. There's synovitis leading to disruption of central tendon. So remember, either it is too weak or attenuated or it's got rupture. So central tendon uh, slip of the extensor tendon has rupture. Because of its rupture, uh, these lateral bands, so always the next thing, first thing, synovitis, and see what that structure is deficient, and then think of what is happening to lateral band. So lateral band now, because it's flexing, lateral band sublux on the volar side. And remember what keep them on the dorsal side, that triangular ligament. So that become attenuated. So attenuation of triangular ligament, subluxing of the lateral band on the on the volar side. And this, this band, which was keeping them on the volar side, becomes short and contracted. The transverse retinoculum ligament becomes uh, contracted. That's all you need to know about the butinary deformity. Uh, rupture of uh, or attenuation of central slip, subluxing of the lateral band, attenuation of triangular ligament and contracture of the transverse ligament and that's it because of the pull is not going anywhere the extensor pull now through the lateral band through the intro, intro uh, intrinsic actually now going all the way to dipj and this is a strong line pull and causing hyperextension here this is a secondary deformity not because of rheumatoid arthritis and that's your classical uh, butinite deformity so uh, next, in the examination of this, uh, you will always say that <coughs> I would like to assess the synovitis. I would like to assess the whether the joint is uh, moving or it's fixed and how painful it is. And if you say these things, there is a classification, nail buff classification. I find all my trainees get very confused when they are trying to talk about it in the uh, not only uh, when they read it one day before and uh, in, in the clinic, but in the exam, because of the high adrenaline flowing, you get more and more confused. So don't go that route. Just say, I want to know whether this joint is flexible or moving on, uh, in the both position of, because the, the proximal joint may affect it. So in the, uh, in the position of flexion of MCP and extension of MCP, if you remember, uh, because that is important to differentiate between the intrinsic contracture. But even if you don't remember, just remember that I would like to examine the mobility of the joint or flexibility of joint. I would like, when I'm doing it, I would see the patient face and see whether he has having significant pain with this. If the joint is very stiff and painful the treatment will be totally different so this is which we'll talk later on uh, when we come into treatment portion so in examination you confirm the deformity of butina you confirm the synovitis you confirm the flexibility of joint and that's all you need to know okay now let's see about the uh, ne next deformity this is exactly the same which i just discussed you got here central slip rupture you got uh, these uh, lateral band subluxed, this transverse is contracted, and this is causing hyperextension here. Uh, and that's all you need to know in Butinite deformity. 